first reading comes from the prophet Joel, chapter 2. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten of grain, has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I, the Lord, am your God and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls.
Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his home justified, rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humble, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Join me in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As someone with a love and appreciation of history, I often perk up my ears when I hear someone say, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The quote is most likely due to George Santayana, a Spanish-born philosopher, essayist, poet, and novelist. Its original form read, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. How quickly we forget the past. Present generation seems to relearn lessons learned by previous generations. It's especially true in today's media culture and social networking. The passionate topic of the day quickly fades into the background as new issues are seized upon, intensely debated, and then the cycle continues as that issue fades away and another arises. I listened to a program the other night that featured several working families who struggled through the economic turmoil of the past decade. They all had faced either job loss or income reduction. They all had experienced the pile up of bills. Some had even lost their homes to foreclosure and had to relocate. And it was hard. Their description of their lives was heartbreaking. But as hard as it was, history tells us that we're better equipped as a culture, as a nation, to deal with those kinds of situations now than in the past. In the past, there were few safety nets for individuals and families. When disaster struck or illness came or war happened, it was life-threatening and hard. And the prophet Joel writes about such a time in the history of Israel. Now, now Joel is one of those minor prophets whose writings we find in the Hebrew scriptures. He was called a minor prophet, not because his words were less important than some others, but because his message was brief. There are three chapters in the minor prophet Joel's work compared to one of the major prophets, Isaiah, who has 66 chapters. In fact, you can read the whole book of Joel if you want in under five minutes. It's a quick read. Joel wrote right after a a very, very difficult period in Jewish history. The nation had been divided between north and south. It was weak politically, militarily, economically. It was subject to invasions and raids by neighboring peoples. And then there was a plague of locusts and a time of severe drought. Now we don't see or read about many swarms of locusts or flying grasshoppers today. It seems like conditions have changed and that doesn't happen as often. But in the past when an invasion of locusts took place it was a time of great devastation. Everything in their path was eaten or destroyed 
grass, leaves, crops. They got into people's homes. They got into their clothes. They filled up their sandals. They fouled standing water. And they drove animals to distraction, especially the livestock herds that gave food and nourishment to the people. It makes modern day disasters almost seem minor in comparison because there were few safety nets for the people. Your family suffered, food became scarce, people got sick, people died, and there was little hope until the next harvest. Like other prophets, Joel looked at the Hebrew nation through the eyes of God and shared his understanding of God's word and purpose. And Joel's message is twofold. First, he saw the plague of locusts and the resulting famine as an outgrowth of the nation's sin. They had not been faithful to God. They had disobeyed God's commandments. Their worship of God was mere ritual and didn't come from the heart. And the locusts confirmed that God had indeed turned his face from them in Joel's mind. Now, today, we don't point necessarily to natural disasters as an act of God to bring punishment. We understand what creates swarms of locusts or earthquakes or floods or fires or hurricanes. We know that they're part of God's created order and sometimes we're just in the way. They're not an act of a vengeful or evil God. The second part of Joel's message brings a word of hope. It moves past the faithlessness of the people. It's a forward-looking message. Rains have come in abundance. The grain harvest is good. The threshing floor is full. Grapes and olives have hung from the trees and the vines and great vats of oil and wine have been stored. God has promised to make up for the years of famine. There will be plenty of food and God's people will once again be able to hold up their heads high in the family of nations. Joel says as a sign of God's love, God's spirit will be poured out on all. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men, they'll dream dreams. Your young men will dream, will have visions. And even the lowest in your society, the male and female slaves, will be touched by the power of God's anointing spirit. Over the centuries which have followed the written prophecies of Joel, The Jewish people have held on to their dreams and visions. Even when they were scattered from their homeland and dispersed throughout the world, they dreamed of a return, of the rebuilding of their nation. They would pray next year in Jerusalem. Even during the dark years of the Holocaust of the 20th century, they held on to a vision of a faithful remnant that would remain, be faithful to God, and never forget what God was doing. Visions play an important role in the lives of individuals, families, communities, and nations. Children with a dream can grow into productive, loving, and vital adults. Children without a dream or who have had their dream crushed by poverty, poor education, lack of family support, racism, or addiction, rarely become adults who find life in all its abundance. As adults, we also need direction, goals, purpose, and vision. We need to be energized. We need to have dreams and visions which enable us to move forward with confidence and with hope. But we also need dreams and visions as disciples of Jesus Christ to understand what God is calling us to do and to be, to find our walk with God and faithfully follow that path that's laid out in front of us, 
to find how and where to use our gifts, the gifts with which we all have been blessed. Without vision, we perish. As it is true with individuals, so it is with communities. Those who immigrated into this homeland of Native Americans had a vision, a vision of a better life than they had in their native land or in the large cities of this infant nation. It's tragic that their vision often conflicted with the vision of the indigenous people who were already here and were still struggling with the consequences of those clashing visions and the methods used to advance them. Nations need vision. Our nation was founded with a great vision. Now, it wasn't a perfect vision, but it fired the souls of men and women and moved us forward in history and in time. When we elect a, a president and those who represent us, we're best served when we have great debates about differing visions for the future. It's our loss and our failure that in this election cycle, we've seen more mud than vision, more accusations about past acts than future plans. Those visions have been obscured by the nature of this campaign. As a church, we need vision. When you look at the history of any congregation, and this congregation is no exception, there are periods when vision has faded and other times when vision, a passionate vision, has swept through God's people. A slide into a faded vision is gradual and, you know, sometimes occurs when things seem to be going well. We become complacent or lax, maybe too self-assured. Vital congregations continually dream dreams and seek visions. And we do so by praying. We do so by referring and studying God's word. We do so by worshiping with energy and creativity. And we do so when we talk about what is our shared vision, our shared common dream. So what is our vision? What is your vision? Amen.